doesn't it seem like in everything we've read, we start with the job is not defined? Well, it isn't in the Constitution, and the First Lady is not on the ballot elected. And we don't have the normal accountability for like impeachment or firing uh, the First Lady. The legal status is ill-defined, although we saw with Hillary Clinton and the court case over the health care task force, we have a little bit more clarity over the employee status now of the First Lady. Not an appointee of confirmed by the Senate, not even like a special ambassador who gets vetted and then uh, might be confirmed or might have a special appointment. So the job of the First Lady really is without that constitutional basis, and that causes a variety of problems for the First Lady. So back to the article that Will did a couple weeks ago, it was about the negotiation of the boundaries of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, what's a proper First Lady role and what's not a proper First Lady role. And as the First Ladyship has become more and more institutionalized, the roles have grown over time. The precedents have been set, and so we have a fairly normal set of activities we expect of the First Lady, and Watson summarized those for us. You know, we expect all First Ladies to do the ceremonial, the hostessing, some political activity, some campaigning. And various activist first ladies have kind of pushed the, the borders of the institution up. And if we think about an institution, we think about things like a budget. And we've seen the budget for the first lady's office become regularized. Staff, 20 to 30 staff people, even more staff than you might have in one of the presidential advisor's offices. And so there is a first ladyship, and then that has evolved over time. And so that's a base on which the first lady operates, social trends, especially in the status and image of women.